Well, thank you very much, Kate, for that very nice introduction. And I especially want to, at the outset, thank uh, Jose Fernandez, who has really been a leader in this process, um, and uh, particularly, and it really takes a lot of people to make these kinds of conferences work, and the EB Office of Agriculture and, um, and Biotech has really done an, an outstanding job, and of course our Office of Food Security at the State Department as well. It takes a lot of people to put on a, an event like this. So I want to particularly thank them, but I, I especially want to thank all of you in the audience, those of you who have been on the panel or are going to be on the panel. You have the expertise that we need in this department in order to do what needs to be done to address this enormous challenge. And it is an enormous challenge that affects the lives of hundreds of millions of farmers and hundreds of millions of consumers throughout the world. So. The fact that so many of you have come here today and demonstrated your commitment and brought your expertise to bear on this, I think, is extremely important and really illustrates the significance of this issue and the necessity of addressing this with a higher level of urgency than we have in the past as a, as a government. And thinking out of the box, how do we come to creative solutions that address this problem in a more meaningful, more substantive way? A lot of you have already done this. We in the government are trying to do a lot more and are very much committed to doing that. Um, your work uh, that all of you do on a day-to-day -day basis is absolutely critical. And the, the priority that I've attached to this, really since I took this job, has uh, come as a result of two things. One, the seriousness of the situation um, for so many people. And also the fact that the kinds of solutions that are needed to address this are, in fact, available for the most part. And the question is, how do you bring them to bear on the countries um, that need them in the rural areas that require them? So it's within our reach to do a great deal more than we are doing and to help a lot of countries. And bold action is required, but it cannot be the government alone. It needs to be the government working with the private sector, whereas you've seen from this panel there are a number of highly innovative ideas. The scale of this problem is something that's also quite compelling. It is enormous. Uh, the numbers are quoted widely that nearly a third of annual agricultural production never makes it to the consumer, or if it does, it arrives in very poor condition. Beyond the threat of food security, post-harvest losses adversely affect farmers' incomes and uh, adversely affect consumers, particularly in very low-income countries. And this is another one of the tragedies that is um, pulled into this overall equation. So it's about agriculture, but it's also about people's lives and well-being in millions and millions of villages um, around the world. Uh, and post-harvest food losses are also, when you look at it from a broader environmental point of view, um, a loss of valuable uh, farming inputs such as water, energy, land, labor, and capital. If we're more efficient about the way we deliver food, we'll be more efficient about the way we utilize all of these inputs into the food process. I came at this uh, at a very early stage in my career when I lived in East Africa and saw the magnitude of post-harvest food losses in that region. I lived in a small area in uh, northwestern Tanzania and, and, and southwestern uh, Kenya. And you could just see these the food piling up, rats and all sorts of insects eating the, the food, and moisture uh, was obviously a very damaging factor. So you could see also the repercussions for human hunger, for loss of farmer income, harm to economic growth. So I saw this firsthand and it became a very compelling issue with me really from those days onward. I've also discussed the importance of reducing food, food losses, post-harvest food losses in my many meetings as I travel around the world, particularly in India where I've spent a great deal of time addressing this issue um, and in many parts of Africa and other parts of the world as well, and also trying to get this elevated as an issue uh, that rises to the level of heads of state and government. 
And we've been able, through the Group of Eight and through APEC, to get this issue on the agenda of national leaders, not that communiques of national leaders solve problems, because in many cases, while there are good language uh, that's included, there is not necessarily a solution included in that process. But by raising the visibility, it helps to focus attention on this problem, and it energizes bureaucracies around the world to pay more attention to it as we engage in the follow-up to these uh, types of summits. There are obviously, as you've heard pointed out, and you will throughout the day, a number of ways in which uh, this problem can be addressed. Uh, the development and dissemination of regionally appropriate technologies and techniques is obviously important, and regions differ one from the other. Adoption of policies and incentives for investment in post-harvest uh, infrastructure, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And there are a number of other ways that this can be done, and I won't go through all the details because I know that those on the panel and others will be talking about this and really know the science and the technology in enormous depth, and their skills and their commitment is going to be very important. First of all, I think it's, it's clearly important, as you've heard today, to develop the technologies and the techniques to reduce post-harvest losses that are appropriate for these local communities. Uh, as I say, they differ one from the other, and certain types of problems exist in some communities that perhaps don't exist in, in others, exist in others. And the needs vary wildly depending on crop type, region, weather circumstances, and other variables. So there's no cookie cutter approach to this, but there does need to be a collective commitment. And there is just no one size fits all solution that we're gonna be able to come up with but there are many sizes and many solutions that can be used for various kinds of problems. The question was raised a moment ago about the U.S. government's role, and I think the U.S. government does have an important role, not just in focusing attention on it, but providing support for the kinds of programs that we are uh, engaged in here in the State Department and USAID. We're taking a comprehensive approach to helping countries solve the problem, and I'll discuss these uh, briefly uh, as, I, uh, as I go on. The Obama administration's Feed the Future initiative uh, promotes a series of programs to reduce post-harvest losses. We think this is very important, and there are many components in that program that are addressed one way or another to dealing with this problem. Let me give you one example, Ghana. Feed the Future is improving grain storage through better technology and better processing techniques. This is one example, but it's an example that actually um, has worked uh, quite well, and there, and there are many others that we're pursuing. So we're trying to look at country by country and figure out how to do this as well as we can. At the G8 uh, summit, uh, which was held last year in Camp David, President Obama and the other G8 leaders, and leaders from a number of African partner countries who were also invited, launched the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. I'm the State Department Sherpa or Sue Sherpa for these G8 summits, and we regarded this as a very important part of the process since it gave a higher level of visibility, but also engaged the private sector in the discussion with the African heads of state and the private sector and G8 government leaders was, I think, somewhat unique. We had never had anything like this before, and some very imaginative ideas came up. And uh, this year, we're going to have the G8 summit in Britain. Actually, it's going to be in Northern Ireland. And uh, we're going to be focusing on the follow-up to that, which I think is going to be very important. Uh, the Alliance emphasizes engaging more partners in the private sector in these efforts and taking bold steps to reduce post-harvest food losses. So we regard this not just as something that was done at Camp David, but something that having been launched at Camp David, we're going to follow up on. The other thing we're doing um, d domestically is we're engaging a lot of private sector partners, world-class companies that are engaged in this process. Uh, just to name a few, because there are many, but ADM, Cargill, Ingersoll Rand, and Walmart have already successfully deployed food storage and preservation technologies in several regions of the world. So I've made it a point and my colleagues in the State Department and other parts of the State Department have also made it a point to engage with companies and with technical experts to get their ideas. These companies that I mentioned and others are making a difference by supporting local farmers, 
by efficiently making their food products um, more uh, mobile in the sense that they can get to the market more quickly, but also so they can get to the market without uh, post-harvest losses, so they can move from uh, the farm to store shelves with very little loss. In addition, country, companies such as ADM, um, NGOs, and individual donors, and many others are investing in universities and research institutes, such as the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and uh, UCAL Davis, both of which are doing a great deal of work in, um, in addressing some of these issues, cross-cutting issues, uh, developing um, advanced research in these areas. So uh, you'll hear more about this, but uh, University of Illinois and, um, and, and Davis are both very actively involved in this. And while I was in India very recently, we talked about what things they're doing and how the Indians um, can continue to plug in or enhance their engagement with these uh, excellent American institutions. Several entrepreneurs have also stepped up to develop new technologies and approaches to reduce post-harvest food loss. Uh, I recently met with a company called Promethean Power Systems, which is a startup co-founded by an MIT graduate and a Boston entrepreneur. Um, this is one of many very, very entrepreneurial companies that has seen this as, as an opportunity. And they have also, in turn, partnered with an Indian company called Icelings to develop a solar-powered refrigeration system for transporting fruits and vegetables from rural farms to city markets. So there's a lot of creativity going on. Technologies like this will improve the livelihoods of farmers in India by reliably getting their produce to the market. It will also help consumers, obviously, by increasing the availability of their food. In June 2012, uh, former Secretary Clinton awarded um, Promethean Icelings, this joint venture, joint partnership, the first ever grant of the U.S.-India Science and Technology Endowment Fund, which is, uh, I think, a way of rewarding what they have done. And we intend to continue to focus on ways in which we can uh, identify and uh, emphasize the good work of companies that are active in this area, and there, because there are many other examples as well, and we want to try to focus on supporting those companies. Let me now turn to um, some of the policies and incentives um, that we're focusing on to encourage investment in this area. Even with the with the very best technology solutions, many countries lack meaningful incentives, affordable financing options, and necessary government policies to encourage farmers to adopt efficient policies and to encourage the kind of infrastructure that's required to deal with this very substantial problem. Many countries, for instance, lack the incentives for retailers to invest in equipment, uh, in facilities, and the stores needed to reduce food loss and broaden market opportunities. And government policies frequently, and frequently, even more frequently, government regulations in some countries make it difficult for investments to be profitable. So there's a lot on the governance side that needs to be addressed here as well. That's why in addition to developing new technologies and techniques, it is critical that governments adopt policies that encourage greater investment in post-harvest storage and distribution network infrastructures. So this is something that also needs to be addressed and we're engaging constantly with governments um, in this area. Some progress actually has been made. As I mentioned, I recently returned from a one-week uh, visit to India where I met with government officials who have taken steps to open India's multi-brand retail sector to encourage foreign direct investment. Um, this is an issue that you've probably seen in the newspaper that affects a number of companies, but Walmart is one that is, is frequently mentioned in these news articles. This policy shift, uh, shift was aimed in part at building modern food supply chains, developing cold storage infrastructures, and improving agricultural efficiency and sustainability in India. Foreign direct investment in multi-brand retail, as well as the development of India's own storage and distribution industry and post-harvest technologies, are all critical for India's overall economic growth prospects 
as well as the success of its agricultural sector. India's Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, um, has been a strong advocate of this. Uh, actually, he and I have known each other for many years. The first conversation I had with him upon taking this job was focused on the issue of post-harvest losses and how the U.S. and India could work together in a broader agricultural dialogue. And we have followed up in many areas, including using our satellites to provide information to Indian farmers to help them decide when to plant, when to harvest, how much water they would need, when the monsoons are coming, when to fertilize. So we've been actually engaging in a very active dialogue with the Indians. And this is really one part of this overall process. Um, Prime Minister Singh made the comment that opening up um, the retail sector and prom promoting an efficient retail sector will, and I'll quote, help to ensure that a third of our fruits and vegetables, which are present wasted because of storage and transit losses, actually reach the consumers. This is a very important point. He also um, has emphasized this on numerous other occasions as he's discussed this issue. And this was a point that uh, was uh, a topic of my discussions in India with uh, the Global um, Food Cold Chain Alliance's India Division. Uh, and I met with the India Division of the Cold Chain uh, Alliance when I was in Delhi. And I also met with the Agri-Cold Storage Owners Association and got from them the kinds of practical issues they faced in trying to improve uh, cold chain storage um, and distribution in Agra, but also more broadly in India, and had a chance to discuss these with Indian officials with whom I met in the subsequent days after my conversations with these groups. So having heard this on the ground from people who are actually trying to address this issue and getting ideas from them that we could pass on to the government and incorporate in our own policies was extremely helpful because, as I say, you have to really get a better sense of what the problems are in each area. And even within India, they differ from one uh, Indian state to the other and even within Indian states. So getting a sense of this from a granular point of view from people actually on the ground addressing this was very valuable. And I've had similar conversations in other parts of the world, for instance, Southern Africa as well. So the key, at least one key, is investment in post-harvest um, infrastructure and we need to do more to help on that and this revival of an effort by the Indians to encourage uh, the uh, multi-brand retailers is very important because it removes one of the bottlenecks um, to unlock business investment. Some states in India have already agreed to allow in um, these um, multi-brand retailers. Some have not and there's some financial and other issues that still need to be addressed. But at least one step along the way has been taken, and that's very important. The Department of State, USAID, and others in the U.S. government are also working with foreign governments across the globe to help facilitate and make viable investment in post-harvest infrastructure. So we regard working with the governments to encourage the right kind of policies and to support American companies and NGOs and uh, universities that are engaged in this process as a very high priority. So let me conclude with a few broad points. One, meeting the food demands of an ever-increasing world population presents a major challenge for the 21st century. That's quite obvious. Um, the amount of agricultural land in many cases is being reduced by encroachment of cities. Other kinds of things are cutting into agricultural land. Some agricultural land is now being extended, but in, it's in many parts of countries of the world that is not, they're not quite as well suited to agriculture. And then we have climate change, which is an enormous threat to arable land uh, in many parts of the world. So, uh, and then of course we have a rising population. So we have to figure out a way of addressing this and reducing post-harvest losses is one critical way of doing it. Among the most important and efficient ways to improve food security, nutrition, and incomes for millions of small farmers is to make certain that every bushel of wheat they produce, every liter of milk, every kilogram of rice that is produced is stored properly and delivered efficiently from farm to table. A great deal of work is being done already to improve agricultural productivity in a sustainable way around the world. But at the same time, and while that is obviously critical, at the same time, 
we must also work to ensure that goods produced by farmers actually have good markets and have a good process for ensuring proper storage and proper transportation so that they reach their markets in good condition without large losses, as is currently the case. It's time now to make solving the problem of post-harvest food losses an urgent global priority. It needs to be a priority for each country, for each region in each country, but it also needs to be a problem that we focus on globally and provide the right kind of emphasis. So uh, this is one of the things we're trying to do. Um, this is a goal that I think is, is critical from the point of view of people in villages in Africa and India and South America and many other parts of the world. Success uh, will improve the food security of, as I mentioned at the outset, hundreds of millions of people around the world, boost the incomes of millions of small farmers in villages and towns throughout the world's developing and emerging countries, and represent a giant step to better conserve our planet's natural resources. So for all these reasons, I want to thank all of you for attending here today. I want to also thank you for the enormous efforts that you're making in, in emphasizing this as a very high priority, in bringing your technical expertise, your management expertise, your policy expertise to this process. It's going to take a collective effort in our country and in your countries, um, for those of you who are representing other countries here and throughout the world to address this. This is certainly going to retain, remember, remain a high priority for the United States. We're going to be pushing this through our various programs, um, through State Department aid programs, and through our efforts at the various highest levels at the summit. And I think collectively uh, we have a chance of really making a major impact to resolve this problem that millions of people will benefit from, and uh, that should be our goal. Thank you very much.